Hello? Good to see you again, Claire. We've got unfinished business. So, where we left off last time. The mutant boss is defeated. The mansion is blown up. The zombies are destroyed. Umbrella Corporation no longer conducts disgusting experiments. Good as one, and it's all over, right? Well... Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Today, we continue to fearlessly dive into the story of Umbrella Corporation, face fear through the eyes of Shinji Mikami and Hideki Kamiya, explore the tragedy of the Birkin family, the beginning of the love story of Leon and Ada, and perhaps travel back to the future. Well, sort of. In short, today, we'll tell you everything about the creation of the legendary Resident Evil 2 and continue to explore the ups and downs of the series. As Queen sang, don't lose your head. What do you think Queen has to do with it if the video is about survival horror and a zombie virus? Then watch this video carefully. You are watching Press X, and we're starting. Resident Evil 2 but first, if you've missed the first part of our journey through the history of the Resident Evil series, we recommend that you watch it by clicking on the link in the description. Have you already watched it? Then let's go. Even during the development of the original Resident Evil, Capcom's planning manager Yoshiki Okamoto offered to make a sequel. Yoshiki Okamoto is a well-known name in Japanese culture as he joined the company as a game designer at the same time as Takuro Fujiwara, although they were both invited to join the team by different people. Since then, they have occasionally worked together on projects, most notably Resident Evil. And besides, Okamoto produced the future film adaptation of the game and the continuation of the series, but let's drop that for now. In 1996, he offered to make a spin-off of Biohazard Dash, also known as Resident Evil Dash. The action would take place three years after the events of the first game on the site of the destroyed Spencer Mansion. The idea remained just an idea, and the studio decided to start developing a full-fledged sequel. After the success of the game's first part, Capcom faced a challenge – to make the sequel more successful and not lose fans. Development started immediately after the release of Resident Evil 1, but the team lost its mastermind and mentor. Takuro Fujiwara decided not to stay in the company and, despite the achieved success, went to develop other unique projects, like the beat-em-up hack-and-slash Mad World or new parts of the Ghosts and Goblins series Ultimate Ghosts and Goblins and Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection. Shinji Mikami, who had proven his professional abilities, was given the position of producer, and Hideki Kamiya, who was a talented system planner of the original and trusty person, was appointed as the new game's director. The game was planned to be released in March of next year, and there was plenty of time. Only Hideki Kamiya was not a horror fan and gradually began to take the project into the action genre. In general, today, Kamiya has created his own image of a tough nut who can be rude or even ban an unwanted user on Twitter. However, you should understand that this is only an image, and in fact, he is a very cheerful and pleasant person to talk to. He is a game designer who can happily come on stream and talk about some of the game's bugs or difficulties during its creation. So the legend of this man will be revealed in today's video. The plot should not have been much different, but should have followed the original game. The action took place two months after the events of the first part. Quote, a certain virus infects all the inhabitants of Raccoon City. A zombie invasion occurs, but this time the Umbrella Corporation was allegedly already closed for conducting its illegal experiments. Well, in order for the player to continue to be in the same tension and atmosphere of fear during the passing, as in Resident Evil 1, the developers decided to replace the already experienced fighters Jill Valentine and Chris Redfield with those who were still green, who had not swallowed up the ground, who had not smelled gunpowder. Young police recruit Leon Kennedy and college student Elza Walker, a motorcycle racer whose hometown was Raccoon City. Well, you know those motorcycle racers. With characters close to the player, it was easier to achieve the desired effect because the player would simply worry more about the fate of the characters who could easily die than about Chris, Barry, and Jill, who had already passed more than one test. The first game footage was shown half a year later in July 1996 at the V-Jump Festival. However, the version, later called Resident Evil 1.5 by Mikami, was very different from the final version of the game. It's hard to say how much, since fate will throw the version 1.5 into the trash. And unlike the release version, in this one, all Leon and Elsa's adventures took place separately from each other and their paths never crossed. Each character had two support partners instead of one. Leon was assisted by fellow policeman Marvin Brunet and a female scientist named Linda. 
Today, you may know her as Ada Wong. Elsa was helped by Sherry Birkin, the daughter of scientists who worked for the corporation, William and Annette, as well as a man named John. You may know him as Robert Kendo, the owner of the gun shop. It seems that if Walter White had been hiding from justice in the world of Resident Evil and not Breaking Bad, he would have changed his name to Mr. Lambert already in the first season and drove off to New Hampshire. So, where were we? The number of simultaneous opponents on the screen has been increased to seven by reducing the number of polygons. The police station was bigger in the second part of the game and also with a more modern and realistic design. And the player had more encounters with surviving and infected police officers such as Leon's immediate superior, Officer Roy. Player characters could use items such as protective clothing to enhance their defenses and be able to carry more items, and character models changed depending on costumes and damage received from enemies. All of this individually sounded very good, but when the studio had three months left before the game's release, they put everything together and Mikami was in despair. The gameplay and rooms were boring. The graphics design, which the developers focused on, wasn't good enough, and as a result, the game was cancelled literally throwing away the version at the 70% stage of completion. More precisely, they didn't throw it away, but made another game using the engine of this version, the Japanese samurai action game Onimusha Warlords. To be fair, it's worth saying that in 2013, a build of Resident Evil 1.5 was posted online, and fans began to work on their own to finish the raw alpha version into a full game, translated it into English, and today you can still play it. But in 1996, things were not so pleasant. The cancellation of version 1.5 was a blow to the team's spirit that had been working hard on the development. There were those on the team who wanted Hideki Kamiya to leave, but Mikami believed in him and invited the dissatisfied employees to take responsibility for the work. The discontent subsided, and Hideki Kamiya did not want to lose his second chance. Production was restarted. Development was carried out by a team of 30 people supervised by Hideki Kamiya. Half of the team had already worked on the first part, and the second half was freshly hired to strengthen the team. Mikami was afraid of becoming a hostage to the genre and did not want to re-release the same game for years, so he planned to end the series with Resident Evil 2. The plot was completely final and did not allow creating a sequel, which in turn did not please the manager of the planning department, Yoshiki Okamoto. Okamoto offered to turn Resident Evil into a never-ending media franchise, which is what ultimately happened. This way, they could tell unrelated stories with common elements forever. Therefore, during the period when the team made no progress in rewriting the script, Yoshiki Okamoto hired famous professional screenwriter Noboru Sugimura for the project, who was delighted with the plot of the first game. Initially, he simply advised Shinji Mikami and his team. However, Sugimura did not like what the scriptwriters of the future game were writing. Mikami and Sugimura talked informally, and then Mikami persuaded Sugimura to personally write the entire script for Resident Evil 2. Originally scheduled for March 1997, the release was postponed by almost a year, mainly due to the fact that not all assets from the cancelled Resident Evil 1.5 could be reworked. Many had to be created from scratch. The main locations in the final version were made more extravagant and artistic based on photographs taken of the interiors of Western-style buildings in Japanese cities. Additionally, Mikami stepped back from his hands-on role in development after creative differences with director Hideki Kamiya. There were a number of changes to Sugimoto's rewrite of the game's script. For example, one of the fundamental plot modifications was the replacement of Elsa Walker by Chris's sister, Claire Redfield, to create a connection to the story from the first game. The protagonists, instead of the visible injuries on the character model, began to simply limp if they received significant damage. Besides that, individual storylines of the main characters from the version 1.5 were combined into a single story. This time, in order not to mess up the voice acting, the developers invited professional Canadian actors. Moreover, there was a competition of 10 applicants for each role. They recorded the characters' voices before the cutscenes were drawn. Only then, they created videos, the actors' movements were transferred to digital images from which graphic frames were created, and then they became part of the game video. Moreover, the model of Ada Wong was not completed in time because this was the only main character who never appeared during the rendered cutscenes in the game. Thus, despite an almost complete restart of the game's production, in the middle of the process and minor flaws that the developers cleverly avoided, the Resident Evil sequel did not take long to arrive, and was released two years after the original on January 21st, 1998.
Two months have passed since the sad events in Raccoon City, or rather in the Spencer Mansion on the outskirts of the city. The T-virus, developed in an underground laboratory of the Umbrella Corporation, got out and began to quietly spread throughout the American Midwest, turning people into zombies. As we said in the previous video, survivors Jill, Chris, and Rebecca Chambers tried to initiate a police investigation into the actions of the Umbrella Corporation. However, the company's influence was still significant, and the corporation already initiated the disbandment of the Star's squad. The characters decide to start their own investigation and almost immediately separate. Chris travels to Europe to find the corporation's headquarters there and uncover Umbrella's illegal activities, and Jill decides to restore order in Raccoon City. At the same time, rookie police officer Leon Scott Kennedy arrives in Raccoon City on a mission and, by a happy coincidence, meets Claire Redfield, a college student looking for her older brother Chris. Her brother was a member of STARS. He served in the Bravo group, which was sent to search for the missing helicopter of the ALF group. In the city, the characters are attacked by hordes of zombies, so they decide to hide in the police station. But due to a sudden car accident, their paths separate, and the player is given the right to choose who to play for. The first person the player meets in Leon's campaign is Robert Kendo, one of the residents of Raccoon City, who is the owner of the only gun store in the city located on Flower Street, not far from the police station. What's going on in this town? Hold on. I don't have a clue. By the time I noticed something was wrong, the entire city was infested with zombies. When news of the brutal attacks became known in the city, sales at Robert's store increased significantly. And when the situation worsened with the mansion destruction and the streets were filled with the walking dead, he began to literally give away his goods, arming everyone who miraculously managed to survive and get to his store with ammunition. Kendo became a hero for the residents and the main hope for salvation. He defended his shop from zombies for four days and even managed to help Leon, but unfortunately he, like most in this city, did not manage to escape. Well, at least he shared his weapon with Leon. In the remake, which we will talk about in a separate video, the story took on an alternative turn and Robert stayed alive. But in the original game, very little time is devoted to Robert and everything that we learn about him is scattered in the game bit by bit. It is known that Robert Kendo was involved with Star's officers, especially Barry Burton. In the Nintendo 64 version of the game, a note on the store counter addressed to Burton stated that the store owner defended the store with all his dedication and believed in the return of the squad officers, that he distributed all his weapons to people, including the revolver that Barry ordered for himself, and that Robert planned to retreat to Stoneville. It's worth mentioning that he supplied weapons not only to Barry, but to the entire Star squad. Meanwhile, in the game, Robert admits to Leon that he has no idea what's going on or why the dead have started to come back to life. But what happened to the city? Wasn't the laboratory under the mansion destroyed? It turns out that while the STARS squad members were cleaning out the apocalypse started by the Umbrella Corporation, scientist William Birkin was working in the Nest Laboratory Complex on a project for modifying the T-virus. The development was called Golgotha Virus, or G-Virus for short. As a result of Birkin's successful development, a new type of biological superweapon, Tyrant T-103, was put into production. Unlike the T-002, which had human intelligence but was unable to follow orders, the T-103 was designed in such a way that it was obsessed with following orders. But in order to maintain control over the Tyrant, he was equipped with a special system of limiters hidden under his cloak. The cloak had metal plates that protected the limiters and made the cloak bulletproof. And thanks to the limiters, the Tyrant was protected from mutations. In fact, if the limiters were destroyed, the T-03 turned into the form of a super tyrant. Its skin became stronger, its heart enlarged and came out. Huge claws grew on its hands and its regeneration abilities made it possible to regenerate even severe wounds. You wouldn't wish anyone to meet him. The scientists wanted to sabotage the project and run away with all the developments in order to sell them to the US Army, but Umbrella Corporation wasn't just a pharmaceutical company. The corporation decided to eliminate Birkin and sent special forces to do this. However, the special forces failed to take Birkin's work. More precisely, it seems to them that they succeeded until the wounded William infects himself with a newly invented infection and turns into an indestructible monster, G. Thanks to this, he survives, destroys his offenders, the special forces, but the capsules are broken and the dangerous virus flows into the sewer where it is picked up by rats and then people. Alpha Group did not survive the meeting with the scientist's new form and remained in the sewers under Raccoon City. 
A few days later, on September 29th, Birkin wandered around the police station bumping into surviving townspeople in search of a host for the virus reproduction. He implanted a parasite embryo into police chief Brian Irons, who was bribed by the corporation in order to hide the consequences of the experiments. Bad luck, Irons died shortly after being injected with the parasite. And this is the apocalypse that Leon and Claire face when they arrive in Raccoon City. Around this moment, Leon Kennedy ends up in his police station. It's infested with zombies like the famous movie. Sometimes the thing you thought was the most brutal aspect of the virus turns out to be the chink in its armor. At some point, Leon's path is blocked by a crashed helicopter, and he's looking for an opportunity to extinguish it. Claire, having reached the police station on the other side, meets the wounded police officer Marvin Brunau, but he is sure that it is too late to save him and drives Claire away. As time showed, he was right. Having dealt with the helicopter, Leon first encounters the tyrant in the corridor of the building and has to fight him or run. In an attempt to understand what caused the zombie apocalypse, Leon meets an FBI agent named Ada Wong. She's investigating the Umbrella's actions. Going down into the city sewer, they accidentally meet Annette, William Bergen's wife. After talking with her, Leon and Ada Wong go to the underground complex to pick up a T-virus sample as evidence of the corporation's illegal activities. Simultaneously on her way, Claire Redfield meets a surviving girl named Sherry, who is the daughter of William and Annette. While the virus was spreading in the city, Annette managed to warn her daughter and made her return home. As a result, Sherry sought refuge in the safest place in Annette's opinion, the Raccoon City Police Station. But by the time the girl got there, all the police officers were already dead. At this moment, Claire, while searching for Chris's brother, finds Sherry. Together, they try to get out of the city, but they are constantly pursued by the girl's mutated father, who senses the presence of his daughter. Claire and Sherry have to split up. Birkin finds his daughter and implants G embryos into her. The girl didn't die and somehow survived. The G virus was compatible with her. It turns out that all this is due to the fact that William was Sherry's father. Anyone else with whom he would have done this would have died immediately, but infecting her own daughter with the virus was successful. When Claire finds the girl again, she experiences severe stomach pain. Redfield discovers an infection with G embryos and decides to save the girl. She tries to find a cure in Umbrella's laboratory is located under the city and meets Annette, who gives her instructions for creating an antidote. At this time, Ada Wong, having received what she wanted, suddenly turns on a dime and, like in the movies, shows that the FBI is not friends with the police. Unfortunately, this hole has more leaks than the Iraqi Navy. F yourself. I'm tired from your wife. How's your mother? Good, she's tired from my father. Good. Today, girl. The fact is that Ada decided to take a virus sample for herself in order to sell it on the black market. Further events in the plot depend on the passing, but the main version boils down to the fact that Leon wants to prevent Ada from doing what she's planned. He refuses to give her a virus sample. Ada points the gun at the policeman, but does not shoot. Suddenly, Annette Birkin appears and shoots Ada Wong. Annette dies from previously received wounds, and Ada begins to fall and hangs over the railing on the bridge. Leon tries to save the girl and grabs her hand, but it slips, and Ada falls into the abyss. In an alternative playthrough, Ada saves Leon from the tyrant, entering into an unequal battle with him. She fires two rounds of bullets into the tyrant's face. The tyrant throws Ada into the transformator and falls over the railing, so to speak, into the mouth of Origin. As a result, Ada, dying, confesses her feelings to Leon, but the self-destruction system is launched in the laboratory and Leon can't stay. He kisses the girl one last time and says goodbye to her, shouting her name loudly. Here, for everyone who doesn't know yet, it's worth mentioning that it is in the second part of the game that Ada Wong first appears in the Resident Evil series, and she and Leon begin a love affair. That's why Ada did not shoot Leon, and he wanted to save her for a reason. Despite the fact that Ada, in the story, is a real traitor, she and Leon develop a special relationship of mutual assistance and care. This love will continue between the characters in future parts of the series because, in fact, soon, at the end of Resident Evil 2, it will become known that Ada still managed to survive. Meanwhile, Annette tries to escape, but this party is joined by... That is, William Birkin. And he kills his wife. Meanwhile, Claire creates a vaccine and injects it into Sherry. The girl is saved. After this, Leon, Claire, and Sherry try to escape from the G monster pursuing them and get out of the laboratory since the self-destruct system has already been launched in it. 
To do this, they are preparing a train for launch and are about to leave the laboratory on it when a mutated super tyrant suddenly appears. Leon can't defeat him, but Ada, who at this moment is already considered dead, appears unexpectedly and brings the player a flare gun and disappears again. Well, what's wrong with these women? Having dealt with the tyrant, the characters jump onto the train. Birkin, who has completely mutated into a toothy anus, is not far behind. He attacks the train and during the battle with the main characters, climbs inside the carriage. Finally, the laboratory explodes and kills Birkin, and the heroes escape by getting out of the tunnel in time. After that, Sherry was placed under close surveillance by the American government as this was the first time she was infected with the G-Virus, after which the human body remained normal. The government decided to keep the girl in isolation since no one knew what a person infected with the G-Virus was capable of. The plot of the second game was coming to an end on this point, but it is worth saying that in the 2019 remake it was refreshed. In some places it was made more logical and more connected to the general chronology the series events already released at that time. But in some ways, the plot of the original second part was much better than the remake. From only Chris's diary in the star's office, the player could find out that Chris tried to reach the public, literally shouted to everyone about the experiments of the Umbrella Corporation and the virus in Spencer's mansion, but the boss interfered with his plans and, quote, turned a deaf ear and a blind eye. Considering that Umbrella provided about half of the jobs in all of Raccoon City, everyone ignored their activities. In the same diary, it was said that Chris spoke with Barry and Jill and left for Europe, where the Umbrella Corporation was developing an even more dangerous weapon than the T-Virus. And he decided not to say anything to his sister because, quote, it was needed so as not to expose her to danger. And as Claire leaves the star's office, a fax addressed to Chris arrives at the last minute. The fax contained the first result of an internal investigation into the activities of the Umbrella Corporation and Brian Irons, who covered up the corporation. This was not the case in the remake, but we will talk about it in a special, separate video. So hit the like button if you're waiting for it to come out. In short, it was Irons who sabotaged the activities of the city police and, instead of working, was engaged in collecting strange paintings that could be found in the area. But if you played the game, you know what a sad end awaits this character. Irons tries to shoot Claire, but a parasite that sits in his body hatches from the chief of police, tearing him apart in front of Claire's eyes. Irons is killed by a mutant G-Virus the development of which he essentially has been hiding from the public. This is karma in action. The secondary character, Ada Wong, will still appear in the next parts of the series. The developers will make her the main character, but we'll talk about it next time. In the meantime, it's time to figure out what was inside the game and how it technically differed from the already beautiful and fresh original. The first thing to pay attention to when talking about Resident Evil 2 is that the game has been released on two discs. Well, it's the second game, and that's why there are two discs. Everything's logical. However, in those years, many games were released on two, and sometimes even three discs, and it was done on purpose. The fact is that pre-rendered video files took up quite a lot of space, much more than ordinary text code. If there haven't been so many of them in the first part of Resident Evil, then in the second game there are quite a lot. Besides, at the beginning, the developers did not know for sure how much disk space the game would take. Usually, instead of compressing the data on the first disk and transferring the data from the second to it, resulting in an immeasurable amount of bugs that would take forever to fix, the developers simply wrote down how much fit on one disk and the rest put on the second, and so on. But in the case of Resident Evil 2, everything was even more interesting. The developers divided Leon's campaign and Claire's campaign into different disks, and according to rumors, this happened due to a stupid mistake, when someone from the developers overestimated how much disk space the game's sound will actually take up. And until the last moment, the game was supposed to be released on one disk until Capcom was faced with a choice. Allocate an additional budget to correct the error of an already very expensive game, or just make another disk. As a result, the player received two discs that had to be changed to go through each scenario once again as another character. There were many games and consoles in the late 90s, but it was the PlayStation 1 games that were the most desirable and memorable. Resident Evil was the first truly scary game, but the second part became even more cinematic and frightening. Here we should mention the scene of the Liquor's first appearance, which has become iconic. Today, it can be said that Resident Evil 2 was one of the best games on the PlayStation 1. The main game concept remained very similar to the first part. 
Survival in narrow spaces, exploring a fictional city, solving puzzles, and fighting terrible enemies from time to time. In the inventory, it was possible to check the character's state of health, change or reload weapons, craft medicine from the grass found in the area, and not only there, and carry various quest items. Healers, by the way, as in the first part of the game, were created from three colors of local grass. Red, green, and blue. And the grass turned into powder when mixed in the inventory. Green was healing properties, even against viruses, and accelerates regeneration, while blue neutralizes toxins. Red herbs have no effect alone, but when combined, they enhance the effects of green and blue ones. Weapon cartridges were created using the same principle. You had to think about which weapon to mix gunpowder for, because it was impossible to take all these and other quest items with you. Space in the inventory, as in the first part, was limited to six cells, with the possibility of expanding the inventory during the game. But the player had to constantly think in advance what to take with him and what to put in a box for storage. Saving was as difficult as in the original. The player first had to find the copy tape for the typewriter, then find a place under it in the inventory and get to the save area with the typewriter on the table. It was impossible to simply click quick save in the middle of a level, as many games allow today. Fortunately, at least the tyrant does not pull you out of the safe room, as in the 2019 remake. And in order to somehow navigate through all the corridors and spaces in the game, a map was a separate option in the same inventory. It had to be opened gradually by exploring new locations and finding new pieces of the map. The game locations were similar to the first part, except that the police station was replaced by a mansion. Yes, the graphics have become better and the effects are more detailed. The quality of 3D objects in animation became higher. Even the ponytail on Claire's head moved. What then to speak of the rest? Well, you understand. We wonder if anyone else had a crush on Claire in their childhood. However, in the first games on the Resident Evil series, there was one condition that was not agreed upon, a trick that Hideki Kamiya shared years later. Despite the technical breakthrough, all female characters were deprived of long and lush hair and had a short haircut. This was due to technical limitations for the implementation of voluminous hairstyles. The environment was created on SGI-02 computers and each background took two or even three weeks to render. Although the number of polygons on the characters decreased to 450, the models remained relatively well detailed. The only thing was that the characters were forced to slowly limp after heavy damage instead of receiving visible wounds on the body. However, some technical limitations of the console did not allow the developers to go wild. Besides, sometimes on old screens, the walls on the way to the laboratory could merge and so that the player knew about the turn ahead of them and not a dead end. The inscription's septic pool were added to the walls. The game became more dynamic, and fighting with opponents turned out to be more interesting. If you don't mind the fact that fighting zombies begins from the very beginning of the game, if in the first part the player could get a little familiar with the controls before the first encounter with the zombies, then here, without any explanation from the developers, the player had to immediately move his feet and dodge enemies. You did not have time to understand how to shoot and where to run. You would be eaten. The same thing was used later in the third part of the series where the player was literally thrown into the fire. The previously mentioned wounded system, if your character was wounded, he began to limp and hold onto his side, did not apply only to game characters. Even zombies received damage and could now attack being only the better half of themselves or with no head at all. And they could also overcome ledges, descend from heights, and take a lying position when they got tired of crawling, like drunks on payday. You probably remember from the previous video that the problem of game loading was overcome by the door animation which became iconic and was preserved in the continuation of the series. This was done because the operating memory of the console was not enough to store more than one room at the same time. So, in Resident Evil 2, besides doors, this problem with loading was also solved by the animation of zombies crawling into the window. But the one who crawled on the ceiling was really scary. It was a completely new opponent for the entire future series of the Resident Evil, added for the first time precisely in the second part. Lickers were mutated zombies that appeared as a result of consuming a large amount of biomass to maintain metabolism. Lickers were distinguished by their large, open brain, the absence of skin and eyes, and were also known for their extreme sensitivity to sounds and their long tongues. It was not the best idea to engage this handsome man in battle. He could take quite a lot of bullets. But if the player was patient and clever enough, 
He was lucky because lickers were completely blind and you could simply run away from him. To do this, it was enough to stop in front of him and wait for him to calm down. Besides the graphics, one of the most important new features to look out for in the 1998 game is the zapping system. The system was partly inspired by the film Back to the Future Part 2, a sequel to the time travel film that offered an alternative take on the original story. So what is zapping? In essence, this is a plot system consisting of scenarios A and B, where some decisions of the player in scenario A could affect further events in the related scenario B and the passing of the second character. Yes, this time passing as Leon and Claire was interconnected and their paths developed simultaneously. That is, after completing the game as Leon, the game automatically offered to load the continuation script for Claire. It started from the beginning but developed differently. You met other characters, completed other quests, and saw the events of Leon's story campaign a bit from the other side. And the actions and decisions in passing as the first character affected the passing as the second one. That is, monsters not killed earlier could be seen in the scenario of the second character. At the same time, even items and keys found in the campaigns of both characters were in different places to diversify and complicate the game. And the most important thing is that after completing the game, you could do the same thing but on the contrary. Start playing as Claire and finish as Leon. At the same time, the plot deferred by almost half. That is, to play the game completely for 100%, you had to play it four times. There are very many secrets in the game. I look forward to having the extra game being discovered by the players. The time needed to implement depends on the individual, but if you play it for the first time, it may take around 10 hours to clear one version. There is only one path for each version. Shinji Mikami But it is worth mentioning that the canonically correct order of passage of Resident Evil 2 begins precisely with Claire's disc, because it is scenario B for Leon that contains the final point in the game's plot. Passing all these scenarios was more fun than passing the first part of the series several times because at the end of each scenario, the player received a unique rank which depended on the time spent on the passing, which was saved. And depending on this rank, the player could receive a reward. For example, a bonus weapon with endless cartridges. There are more weapons in Resident Evil 2. In addition to old barrels like a knife, a pistol, a Remington shotgun, a bazooka, and a flamethrower, there are also submachine guns, crossbows, and electric weapons. Furthermore, some weapons could be upgraded with the help of found modifiers. Moreover, the weapons had some differences among themselves in terms of operation. Not counting the flare gun, which destroyed any ordinary enemy with one shot and was extremely effective against bosses. The differences were as follows. Leon or Claire's regular pistol was different from the Magnum Desert Eagle pistol. Magnum killed simple monsters with one shot. Yes, there were only 8 rounds in the clip, while Claire's pistol had 13 and Leon's had 18, but in the laboratory you could find parts for modification. Magnum could then shoot through enemies standing in the line of fire and hit multiple targets. Claire's crossbow is essentially a weak counterpart to Leon's shotgun. Yes, he can shoot 3 arrows at the same time, but this is usually ineffective. Leon's shotgun can simply blow a zombie's head off with one shot if you aim up. When shot point blank at a zombie's torso, there's a chance to break it into two halves. To do this, you need to get him as close as possible. At long distances, a shotgun isn't more effective than a crossbow. However, Claire is not so helpless, and to compensate for the weak crossbow, the developers gave her the M79 Grenade Launcher. With a variety of ammo options, the Grenade Launcher is a great alternative to Leon's shotgun and Magnum. There are three types of grenades for it. Explosive, fires several projectiles in different directions. Acid, the most powerful, kills dangerous enemies with one shot, and incendiary, sets enemies on fire, effective against plants, spiders, and moths. Claire also has an electric gun, the Umbrella Incorporated Spark Shot, a fairly powerful weapon that shoots electrical discharges that throw enemies back a distance, and Leon at the same time boasts a flamethrower, but this feature is no longer new. Well, we probably can't help but mention the Gatling machine gun. This is no longer an Ingram sudden machine gun, the power of which is approximately equal to that of a pistol and only its high rate of fire makes it dangerous for enemies. The Gatling is a powerful rapid fire machine gun. The only downside is that it takes a while to spin up before it starts firing. It is available to both characters like the flare gun but you can get it with endless ammunition only if you complete the scenarios in less than two and a half hours having received at least rank B. If you get A, don't worry, you'll just have to run around with a flare gun. There were four bosses in the second part of the game. A G parasites larva, a giant alligator that replaced the sharks from the first part. The already mentioned scientist William Birkin, who replaced himself by the end of the game and finally mutated. You can't even imagine what kind of monster Leon has to fight on the train at the very end of the game. 
It's as if Howard Phillips Lovecraft invented this freak. Nevertheless, when the train self-destructs, Birkin finally dies. And the fourth boss in the game was an improved version of the tyrant who literally fell on the player from the sky. But he's not just a biker mice from Mars that falls on the player from the sky, he fulfills his mission to find and obtain a sample of the G-Virus. It won't be difficult to defeat him, but you'll have to do it more than once, and between so-called rounds from the damage received, he'll become stronger. Among the interesting characters, it is worth noting Birkin's daughter Sherry, who appears in the plot. In her medallion, the girl carries the virus sample that the tyrant is looking for, and in one of the likely scenarios, Claire will have the opportunity to save Sherry from the infection injected into her body by her selfish father. You can even play as a girl for a little while, but not as long as with the main characters. Also, playing as Claire, you can meet the same police chief who's cooperating with the Umbrella Corporation. It's not difficult to recognize him. He sits in his office with the body of the mayor's daughter on the table and is thinking about whether to put a bullet in her head, because soon she will become a zombie. Well, dude, are you happy with what you've done to your city? In order not to go into details, let's mention briefly, the boss was in complete despair. It was he who killed all the surviving cops, he blocked all exits from the city, and he was hunting for the mayor's daughter, and his recent target was Sherry. Well, in short, he was completely out of his mind. Also in the game, you meet a man imprisoned in a cell. This journalist, Ben Bertolucci, who conducted an investigation into the affairs of the Umbrella Corporation. In the comic release to coincide with the game's release, it is said that Ben was one of the many visitors to Robert Kendo's gun store on the day the infection spread. In general, it is worth noting that there are really a lot of characters in the game, both main and secondary, which is why it's quite difficult to talk about all the plot twists of the game in the format of one video. The soundtrack in the game was simply great. Composer Masami Uida remained one of the three composers of the original Resident Evil. Makoto Tomozawa and Akira Kaida, who helped him write the soundtrack for the first game, did not return to work on the series. And Masami will work on music for both the next part and for what will later turn into Devil May Cry. By the way, if you want us to tell the story of another legendary series of Hideki Kamiya, write in the comments. We will be happy to tell you about the fate of Leon slash Dante and the birth of Devil May Cry. In short, after Masami was left alone, his role as lead composer turned into just composer. Another composer, Shusaku Uchiyama, was assigned to help him. He took piano lessons from a young age and even briefly played in an R&B band, and in 1995, Capcom hired him to compose the music for Mega Man 8. After that, he moved on to the Resident Evil development team. Under the supervision of senior composer Masami Ueda, Uchiyama adopted his style but also took inspiration from recent blockbuster films such as Braveheart, A Time to Kill, Fargo, or Independence Day. He was helped in the compositions and arrangements by Shion Nishigaki, who was a very experienced composer at Capcom and had worked on the studio's very first projects like the arcade game Captain Commando, Street Fighter Alpha, and Mega Man. In short, the best of the best studio employees worked on the music for the second part. The musical compositions were based on a feeling of despair. As the main composer Masami Ueda created the motif, Uchiyama gave the music a horror feeling and worked on the sound in the video scenes. Composition styles include ambient and industrial. While on the streets of Raccoon City, we hear suspenseful percussion music. In the police department, he uses a piano to highlight the ominous surroundings. And since Unchiyama drew inspiration from cinema, the game included orchestral and cinematic compositions at key moments in the game. This music from the save room still caresses the ears of fans of the series, causing a feeling of security. After all, how nice it was, after long wandering through corridors with zombies and solving puzzles, to finally be in a calm and protected place, where you could save your progress, get the necessary items from your chest, make new healings and cartridges. And from the first notes of this melody, you knew what was waiting for you outside the door. This is the perfection of game design. In January and August 1998, two albums were released containing music from the game. The first album, Biohazard 2 Original Soundtrack, contained the most significant tracks, while the second, Biohazard 2 Complete Track, had mostly less important musical themes but contained an orchestral medley, sound effects, and character voices, as well as interviews with the recording team. In short, Resident Evil 2 was once again a technological breakthrough, and when asked in an interview whether the developers have squeezed the most out of the PlayStation, whether the game would be released on other platforms, and whether to expect a continuation, Shinji Mikami answered, Yes, I think I have nearly pushed the PlayStation to the limit. The production of Resident Evil 3 is not yet decided. Shinji Mikami 
As time shows, it has indeed been planned to release the game not only on the PlayStation, but we'll talk about this later. In the meantime, let's dig a little deeper and move on to what inspired the developers and how they surprised and entertained especially attentive players. As in the first part, this time the developers again filled the game with various references to the horror classics. For example, you can find an almost imperceptible inscription Red Rum on one of the doors, referring to The Shining directed by Stanley Kubrick. By the way, remember we said that the idea of parallel scenarios was inspired by the movie Back to the Future 2? So the developers made a reference to the film by placing a car similar to the DeLorean in Scenario B. There was also another reference in the game in the form of a car familiar to most a broken yellow light green mini which Mr. Bean drove in another film. Furthermore, on the street, one can walk through a basketball court where on the wall you can see graffiti with large letters above the rim. Apparently, it refers the player to the 1994 sports crime drama of the same name starring Tupac Shakur. On the wall opposite, above the rim, is the inscription Blood on the Dance Floor, which is the title of the 1997 Michael Jackson album. Well, the inscription on the wall with the exit from the basketball court read, This too shall pass. This Persian proverb is very famous and popular in the world, reflecting the temporary nature or ephemeral nature of the human condition. Neither the bad nor the good moments in life last forever. After all, everything passes, and this too will pass. The developers wanted to tell the players. And in a small alley where the player is attacked by a couple of dogs, you could stand near the sewer hatch in a certain way so that the camera moves away, take out a shotgun, and shoot at the screen. At some point, traces appeared on it from getting into the glass, such a simple breaking of the fourth wall from the developers. During the opening sequence, we see a gas station with a canister with the Texaco logo on it, which is a reference to the real-life fuel company Texaco, the largest oil and gas corporation in the United States. What are you hinting at, Capcom? The same logo appears a little later on a pole behind the truck. You can also notice the license plate on Leon's police car when he and Claire get in. The number 022297 is likely a reference to the start of work on the second part of the game, after the cancellation of the release of Resident Evil 1.5 on February 22nd, 1997. Have you seen this tailor shop from the beginning of the game with the sign Arukas? If you read its name backwards, it reads Sakura, which is the name of a popular character from another studio franchise, Street Fighter. On the back of Claire's jacket is an angel with the words Made in Heaven, a reference to the rock band Queen. Before the game's release in 1995, the band released an album of the same name, which was the last in the band's history recorded with Freddie Mercury and was posthumous. Obviously, that's how the developers tried to pay tribute to the great performer and at the same time show the character's nature and personal interests. But the most nostalgically pleasing place in the game was the Star's Office. All Resident Evil fans were delighted with this room because it had many references to the first game, although some were not so easy to find. For example, a photo of Rebecca on the table of the traitor Wesker could be found only with 50 clicks. Don't think that's a mistake. Not at all, but a kind of joke from the developers. For the photo to work, you had to click in a specific place and as if you really needed it. Also, if in the first scenario you play on normal difficulty at least, you can get a special key to the locker room with bonus costumes. To do this, you need to get to the police station without picking up a single item. Next, in the lobby of the police station near the computer, pick up cartridges for a pistol, leave the police station, go down the stairs, and meet an old friend. Brad Vickers, the helicopter pilot from the first part of the game. Brad Vickers zombie in camouflage pants and a yellow jacket. If you kill the zombie, which will take about 30 hits, then after searching it, you can take a key from its corpse that opens a container in a dark room with alternative costumes. For Leon, it was a biker jacket with a skull and jeans, or military green pants with a blue t-shirt and a policeman's cap. He also got the opportunity to aim and shoot with one hand. Claire received only one additional costume, a denim jacket with flames. But in addition to this, she also received a bonus weapon, a colt with a high fire rate. The developers will show the death of Brad Vickers to fans of the series in the third part. For now, we can only say that a new special enemy will be to blame for this, not you. Even though the player shoots him, something else kills the guy. Well, besides the jokes in the main storyline, the developers gave players the opportunity to entertain themselves in three additional minigames, Fourth Survivor, Tofu Survivor, and Extreme Battle. To unlock them, the player had to be A rank after completing two main scenarios. The minigames introduced additional characters to complete various tasks. For example, play as Hunk, the Alpha Team Commander of the Elite USS Unit, without a single death or the use of unfamiliar objects in the fourth survivor mode. Or find four explosives that can destroy the virus in the extreme battle mode. 
Here, the players could control Leon and Claire, and upon successful completion, Ada or Chris Redfield. One had to go through all the game locations in the opposite direction, from the underground laboratory to the police station, meeting reinforced opponents along the way. Well, surviving Tofu is a joke from the developers. In essence, it was a regular fourth survivor. Only the player controlled the Tofu soy cheese, holding only a knife. This mode has become a feature of the Resident Evil series and will appear in almost all parts of the series in the future. Interestingly, Hunk as a character did not have his own animations because a bonus minigame with him was added late in production. As a result, all of Hunk's moves were taken from Leon's animations, and that is why he is so strangely lying face down in the water at the beginning of the fourth Survivor mission. And only in the version of Resident Evil 2 DualShock Edition, the player had the opportunity to activate endless ammunition using a special code at the beginning of the game. The code was only valid in the PS1 and PS3 versions. It was necessary to go to the Options menu, select, and select Key Config there. While holding down the R1 button, you had to press the square button 10 times. And if the code was entered correctly, the word Manual Auto in the middle of the screen turned red. That mode was turned off in exactly the same way. So the developers had a lot of fun leaving all these bonuses, easter eggs, and references in the game so that the player could entertain himself even after completing the main plot. All this greatly increased the replay game value and made players into real fans of the series. Many fell in love with Resident Evil after the second part release, so we'll probably stop beating around the bush. It's time to finally see what kind of game was released. On January 21st, 1998, Resident Evil 2 was released on PlayStation. Critics' scores were off the charts. 9 out of 10, 9.5, medic scores reached 90, and the average aggregate score on game rankings was 93%. The game was praised for literally everything. The only criticism was the inventory system, which made the player regularly place and remove items from rarely accessible boxes. We wonder if at this point Shinji Mikami and Capcom decided that the game should be released on other platforms besides the PlayStation, or if that was their original plan. Anyway, after a successful release on PlayStation, the game appeared on other platforms. It was released on PC, Dreamcast, Nintendo 64, and GameCube, and was also ported to the Game.com portable console. Furthermore, a port was planned for the Sega Saturn, but it was cancelled because support for this console was unexpectedly curtailed, and by that time, the developer's attention had switched to developing a new game. Years later, Resident Evil 2 appeared on PlayStation Portable and PlayStation 3. And of course, the versions on one platform or another had some differences. So the PC version had a higher image resolution and a hardcore mode appeared in the game. The Dreamcast version had a frame refresh rate of 60 FPS, and you can imagine what kind of miracle Game.com users received, yet it was impossible to load a lot of information into it, and therefore the game was mercilessly cut. The campaign was divided into two separate games, and the second part, which was Claire's, didn't come out. What kind of modus operandi is that? Doc said it was hydrochloric acid. The Nintendo 64 version of Resident Evil 2 was one of the few games released for the console to feature video cutscenes, despite the limited storage space on the cartridge. Let us remind you that on PlayStation, the game was released on two discs with a capacity of 700 megabytes each. The cartridges were fast and easy to use, but did not have a large enough memory capacity. The game transfer was carried out by nine people, one of whom was a freelancer from Angel Studios, which would later turn into the well-known Rockstar Studio. The Nintendo 64 had discrete graphics and was more powerful than the PlayStation. Games on this console were more dynamic, high polygonal, colorful, and had correct geometry in 3D. And considering all the above mentioned, the version of Resident Evil 2 for Nintendo 64 seemed like something phenomenal. The picture was a bit compressed, but some object textures were redrawn specifically for pre-rendered graphics and improved with bilinear filtering and all sorts of fancy aliasing available on the console. We will not talk about all the dances with tambourines, since this is a separate story. There were a lot of different technical difficulties that Angel Studios faced when porting the game. For example, over the course of several months, the team developed their own KOS operating system for Nintendo 64, which supported multi-threading, multi-processing, and provided information about the operation of the set-top box that allowed them to work more finely and accurately with Nintendo hardware. Next, Angel Studios made sure that the background's resolution in the game was dynamic and varied depending on the number of zombies on the screen. Where there were few of them, the game produced higher resolution textures. Where there were many of them, the resolution dropped. Anyway, in battle, no one paid attention to the background's quality, and resources were saved. Only 24 megabytes were allocated for the intro video, 
The rest was taken up by game files, and in order to fit them without cutting the bitrate and picture quality, the developers converted the frames from the RGB color space to YCBCR. That is, if previously the pixel color corresponded to a mixture of red, green, and blue in the range from 0 to 255, now in YCBCR, the pixel color depended on its brightness, and so that the video does not lose the number of frames but weighs less, the developers cut out some intermediate frames from it and connected the remaining ones using interpolation. If you take the first frame and superimpose a third one on top of it, then when they're played quickly, a second one seems to form in motion. Thus, the video bitrate remained equal to 30 but weighed like 15-bit. Only the Nintendo 64 did not know how to decode video and for this it was necessary to again look for workarounds. As a result, in one year and one million dollars, they managed to fit a game of more than a gigabyte on a 64 megabyte floppy disk. To this day, it seems impossible, and in 2018, Eurogamer even called the port, quote, one of the most ambitious and impressive console ports of all time. As a result, this game version has features that haven't been included in any other system. Alternate costumes, the ability to adjust the violence level and change the blood color, a randomizer for placing items differently during each playthrough and a more responsive first-person control scheme. Additionally, the port contained 16 new in-game documents known as X-Files hidden across four scenarios. They revealed new information about the lore of the series and connected the story of Resident Evil 2 with the stories of other games, including some that have not yet been released. If you carefully compare the versions, you will notice that the version for Dreamcast and PC has a slightly reddish tint, unlike the PlayStation. This was due to the fact that images from the 16-bit PlayStation format were transferred and converted to a 24-bit format. There were no such problems on GameCube. Well, besides console differences, the game has also undergone market differences. As with the first part, Resident Evil 2 has a censored version. The Western version was more difficult. The Japanese version was lighter, but at the same time, it was also less violent. Some of the bloody scenes were cut out of it. The very first re-release after its release was DualShock version, which added analog control to the game with a reverse vibration function. It was in this version that the Extreme Battle minigame first appeared, which after that migrated to all other game versions and ports, except for the Nintendo 64, which was most likely caused by a banal lack of space on the cartridge. In order for the game to sell better, the budget of some other minigame was allocated for its marketing. This is, of course, a joke, but nevertheless, the game's marketing budget was $5 million. In Japan, for example, a live-action television commercial directed by renowned zombie film director George Romero was shown on television. The commercial was filmed in Los Angeles' Lincoln Heights Jail, starring Brad Renfro as Leon Kennedy and Adrian France as Claire Redfield, and featuring them battling a horde of zombies at the Raccoon City Police Station. George was a big fan and pioneer of the horror genre. He did a lot to help develop it, and has been rightfully considered the father of the zombie film. You may know him from the Night of the Living Dead film series, and he's also the executive producer of the television series Tales from the Dark Side. Well, of course, the Resident Evil series was obviously Romero's territory, as the game was heavily inspired by the director's Dead series. The commercial was very popular for several weeks before the actual game's release, but unfortunately the terms of the contract did not allow it to be shown outside of Japan. Capcom was so impressed with Romero's work that they decided that George Romero would direct the first Resident Evil film. However, the director refused, justifying his decision with the words, I don't want to make another film with zombies in it, and I couldn't make a movie based on something that ain't mine. George Romero A few years later, he reconsidered his decision and still wrote the script for the first film, but now Capcom turned the director down, preferring Paul W.S. Anderson's version. By the way, write in the comments whether we should make a separate video on all the film adaptations of the game. Resident Evil 2 formed the basis for several licensed sequels and additions. Ted Adams and Chris Oprisco freely adapted the game for the comic book Raccoon City, R.I.P., and A New Chapter of Evil, which were released in the first and second editions of Resident Evil, the official comic book magazine, in March and June 1998. Probably all these advertisements, additional minigames, and other hype around the Resident Evil series have significantly increased the number of fans and users of the game. Even before the start of sales in Italy, the game had 100,000 pre-orders worth $6 million. In the US alone, in the first week, the game sold 380,000 copies, 
and earned the studio $19 million. A month and a half after its release, Resident Evil 2 sold 3 million copies worldwide, and together with its release on Nintendo, sales amounted to over 6 million copies, which guaranteed the game a huge success. Thanks to this, in 1999 the game was included in the Guinness Book of Records. Well, everyone liked it so much that in August 2015, Capcom Studio announced an upcoming remake. But more on that another time. Resident Evil 2 guaranteed Capcom Studio a bright future and possibly a comfortable retirement. The game would be the best-selling product in the series for a long time, and almost immediately Capcom and Mikami began developing the third part, Resident Evil 3 – Nemesis. On the wave of success, the series must either repeat its previous result or change the gameplay and come into the new century fresher and more energetic in order not to lose its enormous fan base. But we will talk about this in the next part of our story. So like this video if you're looking forward to a continuation and want us to know about it. Your like doesn't only help us show this video to more interested Resident Evil fans, but it also shows us that you're interested. That's all for today. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Don't miss the next one in the series, and if you missed the previous one, you can come back to it. You watched Press X. See you soon.